Yes. Well, the Global Seed Vault is an insurance policy in a way. Uh, physically, it's a facility in the far north in Svalbard. Uh, it's built inside of a mountain and there are three vault rooms very far back in there where it's permanently frozen. And we're going to place a safety duplicate copy of the world's crop diversity there in order to protect it. Plant genetic resources are the diversity in plants that basically is used by human beings to feed and clothe and house all of us. They're important because they're the basis for our life. For instance, we're sitting here in this room, I'm sitting on a, a wooden chair uh, that's made from a resource. I had breakfast this morning, I'm eating uh, food and food is based on an agricultural resource. So all of the commodities, the natural commodities we consume in life are basically plant genetic resources. Gene diversity is important for the species because when the species has diversity, this species has the ability to adapt the environment to changes. So that may help this species survive in the nature. So this is a theoretical point of view. On the practical uh, thinking, the diversity is a kind of resources. The people can use them. Es gibt also Zeiten extremen Aussterbens, äh, wo sehr viele Arten verschwunden sind, auch Pflanzenarten. Und da gibt es also mindestens äh, sieben verschiedene größere Elemente, wo das aufgetreten ist im, im Verlauf der Erdentwicklung. Und anschließend hat es sich allmählich wieder dann, äh, äh, ja, hat es sogar ein höheres, ein geringfügig höheres Niveau erreicht. Und äh, wenn wir die Zahlen, ich meine diese... Erosionszahlen, diese Ausrottungszahlen, die wir jetzt haben, wenn wir die hochrechnen, äh, kommen wir dahin, dass wir uns leider heutzutage in so einer Phase befinden, wo es um extrem, um extrem hohes Aussterben geht. Also um den Verlust von, ja, eigentlich mehr als 50 Prozent der Gesamtartenzahl. Uh, most of the diversity actually is located in the tropical or subtropical area. Those areas actually a lot of developing countries over there. So in, this, in those countries, uh, because of, partly because of the economic reason, partly because of the uh, social, say, population growth, they have not very good uh, policy or strategy to conserve, to protect those species. The increase of um, human population and also the development of uh, economy, infrastructure, are really put very much pressure on the existence of uh, natural genetic resources. So those are very obvious examples you can find in China, find in Cambodia, and find in many uh, developing countries. The man wirft ja nicht nur die 250.000 Arten da weg, wo viele Wildpflanzen dabei sind. Es sind auch noch seine eigenen Kulturpflanzen mit dabei, was er über, über 10.000 Jahre genauer, genauer gesagt aufgebaut hat. Und die Vielfalt wieder, die innerhalb der Kulturpflanzen existiert. Also ist es ist nicht bloß, dass er die eine Seite wegwirft, die wirft, wirft irgendwie alles weg.
The most dramatic thing that's happened in Europe in, the la in recent decades is the introduction of the seed legislation from Brussels. So within Europe we have legislation that pr protects uh, plant breeders' rights. So to ensure that legislation is enacted, you have to have uh, your seed, your varieties registered. And there is a cost association with registering your seeds on that list. Has, the cost has to be met annually. So where you, before you may have had hundreds, thousands of varieties for all the crops grown in Europe, um, immediately when people had to start paying a fee each year to register their seeds so it could be sold in Europe, uh, then the, immediately you had a huge drop in the number of varieties that people were willing to pay this fee on so they could be sold. So you have huge genetic erosion, which is interesting because the very varieties that they need to produce are based on the genetic diversity that's present in all of those old varieties. So there is a paradox there between plant breeders needing diversity, but in gaining that diversity um, uh, and using it, causing the loss of that diversity. Na, die, die erste Phase war die, man hat es entdeckt, das waren einige Forscher um 1914, 1915 rum, die haben das entdeckt, aber da geht ja was verloren, das wird ja immer weniger, das könnten wir aber sehr gut brauchen, so denkt der Mensch immer und das ist richtig so, das könnte man sehr gut gebrauchen und dann kam das nächste, Wawilow kommt jetzt, der große Rose, der äh, immer die Ernährung eines ganzen Riesenreiches, des russischen Reiches im Kopf haben musste oder später der Sowjetunion. So Vavilov founded this institute in St. Petersburg and he founded it just after the revolution. So you can imagine St. Petersburg, the capital of the old Tsarist Russia, and he's going to found a new institute. So that itself shows the level of drive he had. He realized there was necessary it was necessary both to collect the diversity of land races, as the traditional forms, but also the wild species associated with uh, crops, so the crop wild relatives. And he went all over the world, uh, South America, Ethiopia. This was just after the Russian Revolution and got the funding from the Russian government. So he had enormous drive. He was the first person to point out that there were these centers of origin, as he called it. Now, I, I prefer to think of them as centers of diversity, but they're areas where you find a, a complex of the crop wild relatives, close wild relatives, and traditional forms of the crop itself, all within a very narrow location. And he identified these eight centers around the world. We're here in the Galilee, the northern part of Israel. We can see here in a very uh, small area, uh, three uh, wild species that are the origins of wheat, barley, and oats. For instance, this is uh, the wild emmer wheat, which is the origin of all, uh, almost all the domesticated wheats in the world, that it grows naturally in this habitat. Uh, we can see here wild oats right nearby and wild barley, which is the origin of all the barley uh, grown in the world. This, this uh, wheat was here naturally and we think uh, about 10,000 years ago, somewhere in the Fertile Crescent, maybe in uh, Turkey, maybe here, uh, people have started to cultivate it. Wheat that grows in, near the rocks or away from the rocks or in the valley is different one from the other. There's a big diversity here and this diversity is, is not random. It is uh, connected to the habitat where the wheat it grows. So we can find here many different genotypes of, or phenotypes of, of wheat in a very small place and these uh, phenotypes are, can be utilized for uh, disease resistance, disease like rust. Rust comes with the wind from cultivated wheat from either North Africa or Europe and infects the wheat here. Now some of the plants here 
there is a will be more sensitive to the uh, disease and some less. There is selection pressure. If you want this plant here, this leaf, you can see those rusty spots on the leaf. Now around these uh, rusty spots, we can see islands of uh, more yellow uh, colored uh, cells. These cells are in the process of dying out. This is a sign that this plant has become uh, resistant to the disease. We can go and pick up those that are, or screen for those that are more resistant and use their genes to transfer them into cultivated wheat and then the cultivated wheat will be resistant for this kind of rust. This uh, research center is to increase the using of the local resources in the desert and develop advanced agriculture for the local farmer. As you know from the history, 2,000 years ago, the people that live in the desert eat something. They didn't have uh, tomatoes or pepper. They eat some vegetables that grow natural in the area. And uh, we start to look which, which plant they eat. In, for example, the salicornia or the sea aster, it, they eat this kind of product, but from the wild, they didn't domesticate it. Here we domesticated and we built technology and agrotechnic how to harvest around the year. Even they know that and they harvest that from the wild, they have that seasonally, very short season. We check first if it's eatable and it's not, uh, you don't have any uh, poisoned mineral inside, of course. And uh, the first plant that we check, it was the salicornia. The salicornia grow in the wild, in the desert, and also near the Dead Sea. We start to work on this product in 2004. Today we can uh, supply salicornia, for example, around the year. They have that before maybe two months in a year, from the wild. In 2006, we, the farmer export about between 70 and 80 ton. 2007, the export 180 ton, and I believe 2008, uh, it's gonna be double. This is a, a very nice sample. What you can do is just weeds that you see grow outside, and you can actually domesticate it and uh, produce new products. We have a high diversity for rice varieties. Some rice have good taste. Some rice have a high productivity. Whereas in Europe you could see that we have a basic agriculture that's founded on 20, maybe 30 crops. Here we're talking about at least double that. Um, and the number of land races that are still in existence is much, much higher here than it is in Europe. If we have high diversity for rice variety, we can use those different variety grows in different habitat, used for different ethnic groups. As you know, in my country, we have uh, 54 minority people, and the Mung, Mung people is the main group located in this area. A breeder from Institute 
from public institute come here and teach them how to uh, breed new variety uh, with uh, local variety. And then we, uh, we are working in Department of Crop Production under government. We come here and teach them how to evaluate, how to make an experiment. And this period we uh, help them to, uh, to select good variety for their demand. But next step we will teach them how to produce. Nên là người ta vẫn là cho sâu hại là thứ yếu thôi. Còn con này sâu hại chủ yếu này. Thế khi nó mật độ nó có thể tăng lên cao làm lũ. In Vietnam, uh, rice is uh, main crops, and uh, we want to uh, we want to apply the plant variety protection system effectively for encouraging the new variety. Thế như một lần thì thực tế là ta sẽ nhớ. Con kia thì có thể to lên sau nó to bằng gần cái đũa của mình nhưng mà rất là xanh chừng. Uh, here they. Uh, uh, they also attribute to the uh, conservation of plant genetic resource because as you, uh, you see in this experiment they collect some uh, local variety in this area and they uh, compare, they make an experiment, they compare with uh, new variety for choosing which one is best for this area. They find the application um, in uh, this year and maybe uh, two or three years later they will have a certificate and they can, they can exploit their right. But the first, uh, first thing is most important is they can, uh, they can have uh, good, good variety, good seed for their demand and their neighboring. I hope Asia learns from our mistakes. The example I cited earlier of that mass loss of varieties in the 1960s because of European legislation, really uh, Asia hasn't developed that, that level of legislation yet. So I hope they learn from our mistakes and don't do the same things. Um, there is no need to do that. They could uh, adopt a different methodologies for uh, providing plant breeders' rights without the loss of diversity. New varieties on Thailand's countryside. This is what Mr. Pan Pankao from the Department of Agriculture is looking for. <laughs> Today, he visits some local farmers. They claim to have a plant that does not exist anywhere else. Mr. Pankau is here to find out if this plant is as unique as the local farmers claim. The bean, they say, was found 90 years ago in the paddy fields between the rice plants. When they found out that it could be eaten, they started to grow the plant and today it is part of the local kitchen. The local community has a good reason to call Mr. Pankau. He can help them to get their plant variety protected. A big chance for the people, as it would give them the opportunity to bring it to bigger markets as a trademark. And maybe one day raise their own income significantly. Uh, we have resources, but we have not a good policy to manage resources. So we, we fear that those resources will be used by others, not our own. So I think we should uh, coordinate it between countries to make better policy, better strategy to beneficial both sides of those parties. Ideally, we want to save the whole environment but if that's not possible because of the pressure of humankind, then at least we must have islands of diversity that are maintained, either in situ, in nature, uh, where we protect traditional uh, wild species, 
and maybe associated uh, traditional wild uh, cultivated varieties or take the material ex situ and put it in the gene bank. Our gene bank established in 1979. At that time, it was mainly deals with import plant materials for a, uh, as a source for the breeders and for research. In the last 10 years, and mainly uh, this time, we are focusing on conservation and collecting the plant genetic resources of our uh, area of the Israeli flora. We are concentrated on crop wild relatives, but beside this, or in addition to this, we are collecting rare, endemic, and uh, species that are in danger of extinction. The breeders look on one trade and throw out all the others that they, are, they don't need. Maybe they don't know that they will need them especially if we are looking for resistance for specific diseases. And for this purpose, it's very important to go to the center of diversity, natural diversity, because there the plants, the species survive for many years. So the option to find these resistant genes, it's much higher. This is the only option to find these genes in the nature and to use them later on in the modern agriculture, but we need source for these genes. This is one of the important things why to conserve and collect these crop wild relatives. When we collect the seed, we collect it with a lot of information that belong to the habitat and to the species and to the collection, because it's very important to know Seeds, it's very important, but without all the information, it's nothing. So we collect them with all the information about the, which kind of soil, the slope, uh, information about the population. And besides this, they collect also a voucher, a, a, a specimen for herbarium. So we will have an evidence which kind of plants we are dealing with. Sometimes you even don't know how the seeds look, so mainly they clean it by hand because the amount of seeds is not so big, so we cannot use a commercial equipment. And then we count them to see how many seeds. We prepare them for storage and all our storage uh, uh, are in duplicate. So from each sample, we take a, a, a part of it and store it for the next generation. So we are not allowed to touch it. If we want to keep them for longer time, we have to think about slow all the activity in the seeds. So to slow down the activity, we have to dry them, and then we can uh, de uh, uh, decrease the temperature to minus 20. And this is the way that we kept the seeds in our storage room. We have in the scientific uh, community a knowledge of uh, storing seed for a long term. It's not for all the species that we know in the world. There are many species that it's impossible to store them. In the situation now, Many farmers don't plant the native variety. They just plant the improved variety that the rice department uh, produces. So this 
the reason that some variety will disappear. That's why we have to conserve it in the gene bank. We have to, uh, to maintain the germination to, for forever. Then uh, for this reason, we have to know the germination of that seed. If they have the low germination, we have to replant it. If our rice seed seven day it can can germinate, then we after that we take the seedling out and count it and calculate for the germination. After 25 days, we will transplant it to to transplant it in the next field over there. You can see it, and then we can take the new seed that have the high germination. In der Genbank, das Material ist, ist zwar da, aber ähm, es ist in, in einer Form, die wir nicht optimal beherrschen. Es gibt sogar Nachteile dabei. Äh, der größte ist also, dass dieses Material, was in der Genbank ist, in der Regel von der Evolution ausgeschlossen ist, die sonst auf der Erde und auf den Feldern stattfindet. You probably can find a name on the list of in Genbank material. But you do, do not have this uh, material available in the natural system or in the agriculture system. Um, and um, so this is a very uh, serious problem. So that is why we try to encourage farmers to really to conserve or to keep their varieties in a, in a very wise way. When you visit Yuanyang, you will, you will see many rice terraces in that area. Terraces actually run by a minority group or ethnic group called Hani uh, people. Uh, first, they depend on the rice. They have to eat rice almost three times a day. So when they sit down there to be able to survive, they start to build up the rice terraces. They grow rice with water there. And then during the rice growing, the water is still there. Just up to the top of the mountain, there are some forests. So Hani people believe that those forests are given as a gift by God. From a scientific point of view, we believe that um, the forest provides the original water yeah, for sustaining all the rice terraces. So even though they don't know ecology, they don't know the um, scientific aspect of these things, but they believe that if someone destroyed the forest and then the whole rice terraces and everything is destroyed, Actually, they, they, they mostly grow their own varieties. They, the, those varieties have been grown for the, for in the system for thousand years, hundred years. Yeah. And even though government tried to help them with some new varieties, but new varieties can only be uh, good for a short period. So then the, the farmer come back to their own varieties again. It also helped to conserve their uh, plant genetic resources. So, 
So when we're talking about the conservation of genetic resources, we should not only see the plant, we should think about the culture, yeah, the people, and the system. So all these elements come together, become a whole uh, as a conservation strategy. So when you conserve especially for the cultivated species, if you never think about the, um, uh, the culture, then you will make a lot of mistakes. Well, we're organic farmers. Um, we're also organic farmers with a difference. We have a stock-free system. We don't bring any livestock um, onto the farm. We don't have any livestock materials on the farm. So we use the fertility of the soil from within the farm. So we have a seven-year rotation, five cropping years, three years of fertility building, plus we have green manures between the crops as well. So the ground is always covered. Every time a crop comes out, we make sure we have a green manure crop to follow it, particularly during the winter or it's within the crop itself. Within the brassica crop, we also sow green manures. So we're maintaining ground cover, which helps the biological diversity. It means that we have more insects on the farm and a better balance of nature. In the summer, you'll see within here, there would be a whole range of different insects. There'd be beetles, um, particularly beetles. Beetles are, are very common in these sort of environments. And it's that range, that, it's that biological diversity which is so important to us as, as farmers in terms of reducing the problems of pests on our crops. There's a whole range of different grasses here. There's about 14 different types of grasses. There's another 14 or 18 uh, flowering plants. In total, there's over 40, 50 different species growing within this block of land. A lot of farmers would consider hedgerows and field margins to be a waste of space, but we consider them to be very important. And what we've done here, we've got a, the old original hedge, which has been in for several hundred years. We've also got trees. I've planted a, a range of trees here, different types of trees, uh, some of which have um, berries on, some have nuts. Uh, we've got some wild plum, we've got some wild cherry. Some will produce timber, but particularly important is the way they increase biodiversity. So each of these different types of trees will encourage a different type of insect. This is only four or five years old, but we've picked fruits already here. We have wild plums last year and cherries. So it's producing food as well as improving the environment for pests and predators uh, and improving the way we can manage and deal with particular pest problems within the field. We, we grow about eight or ten different varieties of potatoes, so biodiversity for varieties in crops is also very important to us because it means we can reduce the, the possibility of disease. They don't have the uniformity that some supermarket varieties have. Supermarkets want all the same shape, same size, same colour. Um, a lot of our varieties will tend to be perhaps less uniform, so we tend not to grow hybrids very much at all. We have very few hybrid varieties. Okay, well this is Potato Day. This is now the 16th year that we've run this event and it's become very popular. We expect to see maybe 2,000 people over the course of this weekend who will come here specifically to buy seed potatoes for their gardens. It was so apparent that in the shops, if, when, when it came to this time of year and you went to buy potatoes from your gardens, everybody was selling the same varieties and there were maybe only about 10 varieties available. So we thought that it was high time people understood just how diverse potatoes are. Most of these varieties will, will come from small farmers. So you'll find farmers with, who have quite small amounts of land who will grow just a few, maybe point to a hectare of, of a particular variety because they know that they can sell them here.
Garden Organic is now 50 years old. What was then a very small organisation which has now developed to be supported by 43,000 members and has a whole range of activities all around, based around growing organically. The majority of our members are people who garden at home and this is something that's incredibly popular in England. We are a nation of gardeners. We have the Heritage Seed Library, which is our contribution towards biodiversity. The way we run the Heritage Seed Library and the collection itself, this is just some, some of the stuff from the collection, but the actual collection itself has about seven or 800 varieties. Our members can order up to six packets, which we give them for nothing. We've brought along here some of our surplus stock, at the moment we're right in the middle of supplying all our members with the seeds that they order. So they order from a catalogue which uh, comes out once a year and we make this available every December so that by the middle of March we should have supplied everybody with what they want. And we will probably send out something in the region of 50,000 packets of seeds to our members. Leave my gardener alone. <laughs> We have a very major schools programme which is all about encouraging children to grow their own food, understand where it comes from, that a carrot comes from the ground, not from a plastic bag, uh, and thereby get interested in eating it because in this country the diet is not good. I, I think it's very evident that the type of crop variety, variety within crops is shrinking because there's a great deal of standardisation brought about by the scale on which things are grown um, and also by the marketplace. So a supermarket, and the supermarkets are the main buyers in Europe, they will say, we want you to grow this variety. So if you want to sell to that supermarket, and this is probably your best market, the best you'll get the most money from this market, you have to grow what they say and they will have decided that this is the variety that everybody wants. Um, it's a big assumption. The danger is that if we keep on reducing the diversity within the crop like this, we will end up relying on a very, very few varieties. You only need one major disease, one virus, um, or, or, the, um, or any kind of resistance to a pest to break down and that's it. You've lost your food security in that crop. It's gone. The aim of our foundation is to uh, save all the old varieties of uh, different vegetables, of cereals, all what's grown in the in the in the farming surrounding. You can go in a food store in, in France, in Germany, and in, in, in Austria, in Poland, wherever, you will find a little bit the same. So people are looking for specialities as well, for something that is regional, is local. And of course, with these varieties, you are very, very local. We are very, very regional. So um, I think uh, we are responding on a, on, a, on a need. We, we, we came in contact with one of the biggest food stores in Switzerland, that is Co. It was uh, by a market we did. We, we did a big show, uh, a fruit diversity show, where we showed uh, over a thousand different apple varieties, only apple and pears. And when they saw that and they compared it with what is now shown in their food store, they uh, tried to, to build up a, a new image, let's say we want to do something for diversity as well, not only for ecological uh, production, but we want to introduce a diversity in our uh, production as well. stehen wir gerade vor dem Bioregal von der Früchte- und Gemüseabteilung und speziell daraus sieht man auch die Pro Spezia Rara Sorten, die wir im Sortiment haben, als einzige bei Coop. 
die normale Tomate ist rund. Die von Prospezia rara, da gibt es eine gezante Tomate, die hat wie, wie Ecken. Oder eine Hornpeperoni, die es sonst in, in Bioqualität nicht gibt. Also es gibt es wirklich nur in Prospezia rara. Es gibt Produkte, die absolut zu den Liedern gehören, die man dazu zählen kann, wie die Tomaten und die Peperoni. Aber es gibt Produkte, die auch weniger beliebt sind. Man kennt sie halt nicht und man muss es ausprobieren. Die, die Kunden die finden den Geschmack einfach einmalig. Das Einzige, was für den Kunden vielleicht zwischendurch etwas mühsam oder gewöhnungsbedürftig ist, die Produkte sind nicht immer erhältlich, nur wenn die Ernte gut ist und nur wenn es die Saison ist. Man kann nicht sagen, die sind das ganze Jahr erhältlich. Ich denke mir, es, es, die Produktelinie hat es verdient, ausgebaut zu werden. Also wir sind sicher nicht, noch nicht an den Grenzen, doch das braucht natürlich auch etwas Zeit und Entwicklung. Das ist eben nicht möglich, dass man das in einem Jahr jetzt verdoppelt oder verdreifacht, die Sortimentsvielfalt, sondern in langsamen Schritten wird sich diese Linie sicher ausbauen. Uh, Achinoa exists since 20 years now. It's an organization, a non-profit organization. It started uh, with farmers, gardeners, who were growing crops themselves and who felt this concern that this biodiversity is lost. We have uh, currently uh, over 7,000 members who support our work. Uh, and a core of uh, approximately 300 members who are growing crops themselves and who are propagating these, these crops and maintaining an uh, important part of biodiversity. So, as you can see, there are many people uh, come here. They come here to get plants for their own garden, to get seeds. They come also here to um, to get information on how, how to grow the plants. We want to also to convey to, to young people who grew up with uh, supermarket, <laughs> uh, with supermarket vegetables, yeah, of uh, what it is to smell herbs, uh, to taste fruits, yeah, how you can uh, process also the fruits of a garden, yeah, uh, and we want to keep also the young generation <laughs> uh, aware that there is something. Uh, something more than, than uh, you uh, probably are used from, from, from your daily meal. People became aware that this is a threat, uh, that these uh, land races will be lost if we don't act against it, if we don't practically really work on it in growing and keeping these races alive. Genetic uh, material is a basis of food production and we have responsibility for world food security. Uh, therefore, at a time when we are seeing great risks to global uh, biodiversity, uh, it is important we have somewhere in the world a possibility of duplicating all the uh, genetic uh, material that exists in different parts so that when we have any loss arising from uh, this uh, new situation, we know that we can have a backup and an insurance system. I think 
think that it is important for us to realize that seed uh, crop seeds are extremely important for the survival of humanity. But it's also very true that we are losing a lot of seeds throughout the world. We are also losing seeds due to the privatization by multinational corporation, uh, genetic engineering and subsequent privatization of such seeds. And therefore it is very, very important for farmers and especially in developing countries to have a place where their national governments can have seeds stored here, available to them, and safe. We are working very closely with Norway for uh, biodiversity protection against climate change. We have a common agenda. And I think it's a great project. As I said, it's a kind of uh, frozen <laughs> garden of Eden. We have here uh, the reserve of our planet in terms of uh, uh, biodiversity. And so we are very committed to push this agenda also globally. Klar, es ist besser, als wenn man da überhaupt nichts macht. Und man kann endlich mal wieder was machen. Und das ist was Neues. Und das ist so schön. Und wir in diesem Sinne, ja, aber äh, ich denke, da hängen auch viele Probleme dran. Äh, es werden gerade die ärmeren Länder, werden das als Alibi unter anderem auffassen und sagen, unser Material ist ja dort. We want to care the nature, but uh, the problem is, we have to, to feed us first, to survive first. So to keep or to have a nice culture is a probably is a second, uh, second uh, priority. To survive, to be able to survive, to get enough food is the first uh, priority. Uh, I think we have a lot of to do. As a scientist, we have to, uh, 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 to make a voice to the audience, to the government, and uh, allow the public to aware of the importance of genetic resources and to uh, urgent or push the government to pay much attention to this issue. I believe that um, through a tight collaboration between uh, European countries where you have a more developed in terms of technology and knowledge and many aspects and also the rich resources in developing countries, if these two sides merge or marry together, so we will get much more idea or knowledge to help uh, the conservation genetics. It makes sense to collaborate because the principles that are being developed either in Europe or in Southeast Asia can be applied in each other's region. It doesn't matter which species you work on, it's the principles of conservation that are important. We have the same interest of to provide sufficient food for our people and also to make sure that those resources will be available not only for our generation, also for generations to, be, to come.